Okay. Thank you very much, Alex. And um, thanks for that overview of the Best2 program, which has been really, I would say, an, an amazing success. And um, what I hope to do in this presentation, the short presentation is look at the hub that we have been um, coordinating, so the South Atlantic hub, and just give you a flavor of the real detail and the stories from the ground of these projects. Um, you know, converting those numbers, which are quite um, impressive, into actual individual underground projects. So uh, by way of introduction, my name is Tara Palimbi. I'm the Deputy Director of the South Atlantic Environmental Research Institute. Uh, I'll give us a brief introduction in another slide, but we run the regional best hub for the South Atlantic. Um, so I just wanted to know, just throw it out there, how many of you actually know about the South Atlantic Islands? And if anybody knows that they even exist, I know the numbers of the projects that you saw in Alex's presentation in our region are relatively small compared to the Caribbean and the Pacific. Um, but given the, the number of islands we have and the size of our population, I think they, we are punching a bit above our, our weight in terms of um, the conservation stories that we have from the remote South Atlantic Ocean. And to, so today I'm gonna to be telling you in detail about six of our projects. So the ones that have been done under the best 2.0 uh, program and introducing you to some of the amazing cons conservationists who work, who are from our islands and work on our islands, just to show you what they've managed to achieve through the Best Two program, um, which is nothing less than extraordinary. So, just a quick overview of who we are. Um, next slide, please. So, Sari is the South Atlantic Environmental Research Institute. We were set up in 2012 uh, in the Falkland Islands by the Falkland Islands government. And we undertake uh, environmental research throughout the South Atlantic from the tropics down to the ice. We also coordinate in international research and have research programs in other countries and islands, uh, the South Atlantic islands around Southern Africa, the Caribbean, and we have good alliances with our colleagues in South America as well. But in the context of this particular program, as I've mentioned, we coordinate the regional hub uh, for the South Atlantic. So that means that we work for and with IUCN um, to be their eyes on the ground, to coordinate and build relationships with all of the project managers, uh, monitor the projects, Etc., and also trying to maximize the benefits of the projects once they're completed to share lessons across each of the islands um, in our hub and beyond. Next slide, please. So, BEST 2.0, um, I won't go through this in detail. Alex has already mentioned it, but I think it is a specifically um, important program because it is one of the few that focuses on. Um, Europe of European overseas, so overseas territory, European overseas territories, and there aren't that many um, funding sources that are directed towards these islands that have incredible biodiversity. So it is a program that we, program of uh, funding program that we really value. And as Alex showed in his slides, um, just to reiterate, the EU overseas are um, global. You know, it's, we're talking about every single ocean across the world. Um, and here in red, you'll see us in the South Atlantic. So we'll give you a whistle -top stop tour of the four overseas territories in the South Atlantic. Next slide, please. So here in the South Atlantic, we have had six projects under the BEST 2.0 scheme. Um, one looked at say whales in the Falkland Islands. One looked at uh, gumwoods in Peakdale in St. Helena Island. Another one looked at peaks trails and upgrades in St. Helena. Native plant nurseries in St. Helena, a fifth at forest and biosecurity in Tristan de Kuna. And one, the sixth at sea mounts in Ascension Island. So for um, the Ascension project was a medium grant just less than 2,000 um, 
euro, 200,000 euros, sorry, and the other five were small grants, so between 50 and 100,000 euros, which was, so the total amount was around 630,000 euros. Next slide. So let's start now, um, talking you through the islands and the projects that were implemented there. So our first stop is the Falkland Islands, where Sari's um, main office is located. This shows you an aerial image of the islands. Um, they are the largest of the four territories in the South Atlantic and home to a wide open landscapes, um, but a tiny population of just 3,300 people. And un another unusual statistic, half a million sheep. So there's always <laughs> a ratio of people to sheep, which I'm not sure is one that uh, is particularly helpful, but, but I guess that also gives you an indication of the size of the islands. Um, next slide. So one project uh, was funded in the Falkland Islands, and this one looked at de developing a site-based conservation approach for say whales at Berkeley Sound. Uh, this was led by Falklands Conservation. The conservation manager was Dr. Andrew Stanworth, and the cetacean expert was Dr. Caroline Weir. The photograph that you see here are a pair of the say whales, so the species that was, was studied under this project. Next slide, please. So by way of background, um, the say whale is classified as a globally endangered. Before the project, the main source of information on the say whales in the Falklands was from um, statistics and information from the old whaling industry. So there really was no current information. They're particularly also as a species particularly challenging to monitor because they live mainly in offshore deep water habitats. So they're not seen very often. They mainly, um, they're known to be sporadic, unpredictable and elusive. But in the Falklands, they actually do come right up to the coast um, and into these more shallower sounds. You'll see Berkeley Sound here. And so it's one of the best places in the world to actually study the species. The image that you see here um, is Berkeley Sound uh, and adjacent areas are located off East Falklands. So this was the study area of the project. Um, it's a key biodiversity area, a KBA, and the red line on this map um, is the actual KBA boundary. It's, but Berkeley Sound is of particular conservation and management importance um, because it is located close to the capital Stanley. So I guess the, it is one of the areas where there is more activity um, within the more human activity within the marine environment. Uh, it's one of the busiest shipping areas, for example, a mooring place for ships, um, potential offshore oil and gas industry, and the only area in the Falklands um, where commercial whale watching currently occurs. Next slide, please. So the project aims to increase, or it aims to increase the knowledge of the whales to derive information on their number, their distribution, their interactions with human activities, um, and also there was an element that was about raising awareness with the public, the relevant stakeholders and the decision makers in the Falkland Islands. And the third aim was to provide management recommendations um, in relation to mitigating any potential impacts on the whales from human activities in Berkeley Sound through the development of best, best practice guidelines for maritime users, including those offering whale watching and ecotourism. So a lot of these, um, aims and objectives are long-term and they do require significant um, input on island and Falklands Conservation is, is the non-governmental organization is based in the Falkland Islands. So that's uh, very advantageous in terms of the aims of the project. Up in the left corner here, so the images that you're seeing on your screen, that's the say whale and at the bottom right you have Caroline Weir, Dr. Caroline Weir um, from Falkless Conservation collecting fecal samples which uh, were analyzed in the labs. Next slide please. So the project's completed and has 
quite uh, significant or impressive achievements um, outlined. So it was confirmed that Berkeley sand is used by say whales as a summer and autumn feeding ground. Uh, there were about 12,000 plus photo ID images taken, confirming at least 87 individual whales during 2017. So that's um, a really impressive number as well. The data collected contributed to an environmental impact assessment for oil, offshore oil and gas. And it was also the first systematic data collected on whale occurrence in the Falkland Islands. So some really impressive achievements from this project run by Falklands Conservation in the Falkland Islands. Next slide, please. So now we move further north um, to St. Helena. You'll see here where that sits in the global map. Um, and we also have an aerial image. It's a small subtropical island, 10 miles by six miles. Um, 120 miles west of the African mainland and only 4,500 people. If you just do another click through, you'll see the aerial image, which shows the dry, arid coastline and a green interior with a, a relatively small cloud forest at the top. The highest point being, here we go. So you'll see here, just visually, you can notice the difference between that green interior and the arid, um, X, yeah, the, the arid loop around the island. And that the highest point there is about 820 meters. So as I mentioned in the beginning, there were three projects in St. Helena. So we'll look at the first one. Next slide, thanks, which is looking at the restoration of Peak Dale's St. Helena Gumwood Forest. So this project was led by Annalie Beard and Martina Peters um, from the St. Helena Nature Conservation Group, another small non-governmental organization on the island. Um, the photograph you see here are the Gumwood Guardians. Um, so, uh, a process for nominating gumwood guardians um, was developed. And here's an example of one of the days where the gumwood guardians uh, remove invasive species from the last remnants of the forest. Next slide, please. So why the gumwood? What is the gumwood? Um, it's an endemic plant of St. Helena and it became the island's national tree in 1977. There was almost no successful natural regeneration of this tree, and it was listed in 2014 on the IUCN Red List as critically endangered. The project site, which is an area called Pigdale, is um, the, in the isolated western end of the island and represents the last wild remnant of the species. So in this photographs here, you see the gumwoods at different angles and at different ages. They're important because, not only because of their um, endemic and their critically endangered status, but they also provide a habitat for many other St. Helenian endemic flora and fauna. And they're under threat, particularly by stripping of the bark by rabbits and rats, the trampling of seedings and soil erosion by feral livestock, and the smothering from invasive tree species. So the St. Helena Nature Conservation Group, as I mentioned, the small NGO that is made up of volunteers, um, wanted to reduce these threats and encourage the seedling growth and to ensure the continued existence of these trees. Next slide, please. So what you see here is an aerial image of the Pigdale site. Um, the site is about 600 meters long by 150 meters wide, and the green dots are the marked gumwood trees. So each individual tree was actually marked, uh, and the red line is a cattle fence that was uh, built to protect the area. The aims were to 
halt, the aims of the project were to halt the decline of the forest through the development of a best practice technique for forest restoration um, that would be trialed here and could potentially be used elsewhere on the island. This fence, um, you'll, as I mentioned, this red fence line that you can see here was built around the gunwoods to keep out the feral livestock. And rabbit proof enclosures were also um, built in certain areas. So you'll see the slide, the dotted red line are the rabbit enclosures that were also constructed. And then another element of this was to engage the community in conservation um, through this establishment of the Scumwood Guardians program. That was another volunteer group that focused specifically on this um, geographic area of gumwoods on the island. And then a final element of the project was to plant the gumwood trees back into the wild. So next slide, please, thanks. The main achievements of this project are that the stock fence, the area stock was fenced. All of the three rabbit areas were fenced. Um, the two conservation methods used were proved useful and are likely to be trial uh, rolled out to other areas of the island. There was some edging around the gumwoods and some basal barking, which um, improved an effective method for clearing invasive plant species. In terms of the engagement, the gumwood guardians um, gave four, four, eight, nine hours of work clearing their invasive species. So 15 volunteer days, and there were 100 plus gumwood trees planted. The local stakeholders were skilled, knowledgeable, and equipped to continue restoration and ensure continued conservation capacity. So another example of a locally built, locally led project that had some really significant success um, for, for a critically endangered species on St. Helena. So what I wanted to um, show you here now, and the next slide is a marker for me to um, just show you a short video that we made about this particular project. Uh, Martina, who ran the project, isn't able to be here, but this is her in situ, taking you through the area, and it gives you a flavor of what the whole project was about and of what the landscape looks like. So if I share my screen. Um, one second. I'm Martina Pittis. Uh, so we are at Pigdale, which is the last remnant of ancient gumwood forest anywhere in the world. We had a project here titled Restoration of Pigdale's Gumwood Forest. And the reason it's so important is because it is an endangered uh, gumwood species. Um, it was South St. Lena's National Tree in 1977. This tree is part of the last remaining ancient gumwood forest. So there's nowhere else you're gonna find a tree of this species that is this big. The project aims here to halt the decline of the gumwood forest as it was dying out. Um, the trees dying from pests and disease, as well as there was no natural generation of seedlings happening. So what this project aimed to do is to restore it to its former glory um, and to join up all the patches that spread out along this site. So what we did here is 
we cleared out invasive species using the Bradley method where we cleared directly around the tree just so to avoid the elements getting in and drying out the soils or nothing the tree ever once it becomes exposed. We also educate the public and keep them up to date with our activities through um, newspaper articles and radio interviews as well as engaging other key stakeholders such as the National Trust and EMD um, even to some school groups to come down and plant uh, some gumbo trees. While I restart the presentation, could you please drop the link to the YouTube uh, page for the clip? Yes, yeah, so. Perfect. So yeah, apologies. We'll include the link, uh, no worries, when uh, we post about the session. Yeah, apologies for the no sound there, but hopefully the visuals gave you a flavor of the landscape and the trees in situ and Martina doing the amazing job that she did for that project. So I will, yeah, circulate the link later as well. We, we have a few actually, but I'll just show you this. I just showed you this one, but I can circulate the links for all of this mini videos that we have with the various projects. Great, great, thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, so next slide. So the second project um, that was run on St. Helena was looking at trails and interpretation improvements in the Peaks National Park on the island. So this was led by the Environment Management Division of the St. Helena government. So this was the government department. Um, with the St. Helena Tourism as a project partner. And the kind of the project managers and leads were Mike Javor and Lawrence Milan. The photo that you see here are, is the cloud forest habitat I mentioned earlier in the talk um, on St. Helena in the middle of the Peaks National Park. And the other picture is a flowering black cabbage tree, another of the island's endemics. Next slide. So by way of background, um, the cloud forest in the Peaks National Park is a threatened habitat. There are only 20 hectares um, remaining. It's a rich community of endemic ferns, tree ferns, black cabbage trees, and its habitat is numerous, um, has numerous other plants and animals. So there are of course threats to this cloud forest, primarily from invasive plants, um, habitat fragmentation and species loss, climate change and tourism. So the trails in the National Park are very popular with tourists and increased tourism from the island's airport opening has put, was putting some pressure on these trails, causing erosion and damage to the surrounding vegetation. A solution was needed to provide improved, safer access for park users in a way that minimized disturbance to the sensitive environment. So the project aimed to, it was a very practical project. Um, it aimed to build a series of boardwalks, staircases and handrails and a hiking shelter on the peak trails. Uh, it also aimed to raise the profile of conservation within the forest and the national park and to make the national park uh, icon for ecotourism on St. Helena. So very hands-on, practical and tangible. And the next series of photographs will show you the before and after. So the first one that we had up there was the staircases that were built. You saw the before and after. This one here are the paths before and now some boardwalks have been installed. Um, the nice before and after of that one here. And then the next one is uh, hiking 
uh, sorry, some handrails that were built on the pathways. You can see in this one particularly, it looks like that handrail was a real requirement <laughs> when you look at the steepness of the slope. So really important too from a health and safety perspective. And then the final one is a hiking shelter uh, for visitors, but also more, more importantly, probably for people working on the, in the national park. So that there's a, it's a field station for the team, the government's team that work on the park. Um, and as you'll see, it has corrugated iron, a corrugated plastic roof, a tool shed, and, and all of these things that are really required. And then, an important change here from the before and after. So very practical, very hands-on project. And if we just go on to the next slide, those tangible achievements were four kilometers of overgrown trails cleared and made accessible, 25 meters, two foot, sorry, 275 meters of boardwalks, stairs, staircases and handrails installed. The hiking shelter constructed that you saw the trails now more safe and accessible and um, the national park moving towards its goal of becoming an ecotourism destination. And in the photograph here, you'll see uh, one of the promotional events on island where the national park particular project was promoted at one of the community events. So another great success story. And then our third and final project on St. Helena uh, under this best two program was called Nurseries for Nature, increasing the capability at St. Helena's endemic nurseries. So you'll have picked up by now that um, there are a suite of endemic plants on St. Helena and this one was focusing, at, um, focusing on propagating those. So this project was led by the St. Helena National Trust again by Martina Peters, who you saw in the earlier video, and also by Amy Jane Dutton. The project partner was the Environmental Management Division of the St. Helena government who led the previous project. In our photographs, you'll see uh, Richard at the Millennium Forest Nursery on the left, and on the right, William and Leslie at the Peaks Nursery. So two of the nurseries that were strengthened through this project. Next photograph, please. By way of background, um, as I mentioned, St. Helena is home to many endem endemic species. The figures are around a third of all endemic biodiversity found in the UK and its overseas territories. Of the 45 vascular plants found on St. Helena, 10 have less than 100 individuals remaining in the wild. So really on the brink of extinction. And most are listed as endangered on the IUCN's red list. So their survival really relies on growing as many plants as possible in the island's nurseries and replanting them back into the wild. The St. Helena has three nurseries um, for growing endemic plants and the conservationists there use them for habitat restoration. St. Helena's government runs two of the nurseries one at Scotland, where they grow the entire spectrum of plants from dry land species to cloud forest species and ferns. And there's also one at the Peaks National Park, that you saw, the park that you saw earlier, which grows exclusively cloud forest species for restore, restoration in the National Park. The St. Helena National Trust has a nursery at the Millennium Forest uh, Restoration Site where they specialize in dry land species. The limiting factor for habitat restoration is the capacity to produce plants in the nurseries. So the more plants that can be produced, the more habitat that can be restored. It's as simple as that. So um, again, very practically, there was a need to increase physical capacity for growing the plants, as well as um, for creating better and more efficient systems of propagation. So the project aimed to upgrade the nursery facilities at three nurseries, providing improved growing conditions to grow more plants and put them back in the wild. It also aimed to increase the number of local conservation staff and to develop their propagation skills. 
and its third aim was to establish a production cycle for some of the rarest species in the pigs nursery that the main species being the St. Helena lobelia, Diana's pig grass and whitewoods. And at the Millennium Forest Nursery, the Clefia grass, tea plants and salad pond. And then finally, there was a awareness raising component of the project, raising awareness of the island's habitats and of the conservation effort. And in this photographs here, you'll see at the top left, um, local politicians, visiting the project and visiting the new shade house and nursery. In the below left, um, some construction images. Uh, and below right, the endemic Diana's peak grass and the lobelia grown in the nursery. So just to go to the next slide and follow up on the achievements of that project, the main achievement uh, that the, the nurseries um, were successfully expanded uh, particularly the peaks and the Millennium Forest nurseries. There was a laminar flow cabinet which provided, was provided to the nursery at Scotland for fern propagation. There were skills workshops that encouraged knowledge sharing between the organizations um, and between individuals. Six endangered species um, established a comprehensive production cycle and the ability to restore habitats was greatly increased. In your photograph here, um, this was one of the outreach events where the project achievements were shared as part of the St. Helena government's Scotland Nursery open, Opening Day that is um, run by Vanessa, who is the lead on the nursery in St. Helena government. Next slide, please. So those were the three projects on St. Helena. We're moving around the South Atlantic and now off to Tristan da Cunha. Um, so here is the global location of Tristan da Cunha. This pop-up map shows you Nightingale Island, which is an offshore island, um, uninhabited. The population of Tristan live on the main island. But Nightingale Island was the focus of the BEST 2.0 project. Tristan has a population of less than 300 people and is one of the most remote habitat inhabited islands on the planet. Um, the next image here just is an aerial view of a satellite view from Google of the Nightingale Island where the project took place. So there was just one project for Tristan de Kuna. Um, it looked at the forest restoration and improved biosecurity on Nightingale Island. It was led by the Conservation Department of the Government of Tristan de Kuna and individuals leading it were Trevor Glass um, from the island and Ben Dilley. So in these photographs here, on the left we have the Wilkins Bunting and on the right we have an image of Nightingale Island. By way of background, um, Nightingale Island is the smallest of the four islands that form the Tristan Archipelago. It's 20 miles from the main island, uninhabited. So it's just a remote island wilderness. The coastal lowlands and cliffs are up to, of up to 500 meters are covered with this tussock grass, um, broken only by occasional island trees. Phylica arborea and small patches of shorter vegetation dominated by ferns. It's home to two endemic land birds. One of these is the Wilkins bunting, which is listed as endangered. So prior to this project, it was thought that approximately just 50 to 80 pairs of Wilkins bunting breed on Nightingale Island. And their persistence was threatened by this very small population size, their sensitivity to habitat loss and potential for accidental introductions of predators. So the birds are find, found primarily in the Phylica woodland. So this interconnection um, between these species in which they forage and their beak is specialized to crack open the Phylica fruits as their primary food source. So without the woodland, 
obviously this endangered bird species would be likely to go extinct. There were ever present concerns include um, catastrophic weather events with strong winds um, and the introduction of invasive rodents and other alien species. So something had to be done to conserve this uh, endangered species. Next slide. So the project um, aimed to understand the factors affecting the Wilkins bunting population to improve knowledge so that they could work out how to best conserve them. It also aimed to learn methods for pro propagating the phylica trees in order to restore the habitat for the bunting. And finally, it wanted to improve biosecurity measures and formulate a biosecurity protocol for Nightingale Islands to reduce the possibility of invasive species being established there. In particular, there we're looking at biosecurity protocols for sooty mold fungus and for the scale insect. So just to explain the photographs, in the top left, you, um, sorry, I think I'm on the next slide. So this, these, these images in this particular photograph are of the bunting itself um, at various stages. And then in the next image, you'll see the phylica seedlings at the top right the scale insects on the phylica, um, and at the bottom, the Tristan Dakuna government conservation team who led and were instrumental in making sure that this project was a success. So in terms of achievements, um, the main achievements under this project were this increased knowledge of the breeding biology and population estimate of the Wilkins bunting, the project team actually spent two summer field seasons on Nightingale Island, um, during which they spent all of their time undertaking, undertaking this work. So it's, it's, it's a track. You, they go there, camp there, stay weeks away from their family. Um, the next achievement was a Phylica nursery, which was created, and the trees were planted back into the wild. They discovered an invasive species. Uh, a scale insect which live on, lives on the phylica trees. And without the project, it would be, it's, un, it's really unlikely that this infestation would have been identified and surveyed. They gained specialist skills, being able to identify and assess the health of the phylica trees, identify, locate, and monitor different scale insects, as well as finding and identifying the actual bunting nests. The biosecurity protocols were improved, um, they were adopted, and an effective monitoring program was established as well. So again, significant achievements for endangered and critically endangered species um, in Tristan Acuna. And then lastly, our final project, we're off to Ascension Islands, um, further north in the South Atlantic, just five degrees south of the equator. Um, although this image is of Ascension Islands and gives you a feel for, I guess, an aerial view of the islands, the project focused um, on the offshore sea, mon sea monks, and we'll show you a, a map of those soon. But just to give you the background, um, Ascension is just 35 square miles, a thousand miles from Africa and less than 1000 people live here. So as I mentioned earlier, the collective population of all of the South Atlantic islands is probably just about 9,000 people. So there was only one project on St. Helena, uh, um, on Ascension, sorry, a medium grant, uh, the only medium grant for the South Atlantic, which looked at an ecological assessment uh, in Ascension Island's shallow water seamounts as a candidate for marine protected areas. It was led by the Conservation and Fisheries Department of the Ascension Island government, and the individual lead was Dr. Sam Weber. There were numerous project partners, including University of Exeter, the National Geographic Pristine Seas, British Antarctic Survey, University of Windsor, University of Western Australia and the UK Centre for Fisheries 
and aquaculture science, CFAS. The photograph here is of the silky sharks um, in ascent and waters. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, this is the visual of the offshore sea mounts that were the focus of the project. You'll see the island itself now, a very small dot in the middle of the EEZ. So by way of background to the project, it was developed to address a specific knowledge gap relating to the biodiversity of three shallow water sea mounts, that these three shallow water sea mounts that lie within Ascension's EEZ. As you all know, seamounts are underwater mountains and are known to be hotspots of abundance and diversity for large pelagic species, particularly in comparatively unproductive tropical oceans. So in 2016, the UK government announced their intention to create the island, the Atlantic's largest no-take marine protected area in the waters surrounding Ascension Island. As part of the Blue Belt program, um, and as part of the government's long-term commitment to protecting marine habitats in British waters. However, there, were, there was a drive to have a strong science um, and evidence base to underpin the creation of a marine protected area and to inform its monitoring and future management. Next slide, please. So the project aimed to measure the biodiversity footprint of these understudied seamounts, um, to provide an evidence base for recommendations for the size and the place of the placement of the marine protected area, to use a range of scientific tools to measure how the abundance, diversity, and community composition of the marine organisms at different levels of the food chain vary within distance from the summit of each mount and to deploy satellite tags and acoustic transmitters on, transmitters on sharks and tuna to study how individual animals use sea mounts, how long they stay, how far they roam, and where they travel to. So your images here just give you a flavor of what that research looks like in practice. Um, using beta, baited underwater video surveys or bruvs, you'll see up in the top, the Dorado, fish swimming by one of the bruvs. At the bottom, the, some more of the silky sharks. And at the right there is an image of the tagging of a male tiger shark. Next slide, please. In terms of achievements for this particular project, more than 50 sites were surveyed, which provided unequivocal evidence of the importance of the seamounts as aggregation areas for pelagic sharks fish, and to a lesser extent, seabirds. There were 50 baited remote underwater video surveys completed, more than 240 linear kilometers of bioacoustic and surface visual transect data was collected. 48 sharks and tuna were tagged with satellite linked and acoustic tracking devices, and over 100 zooplankton trawls and water column profiles were conducted. And by way of update after the end of the project, um, in August 2019, the governor of Ascension Island accepted the, the government of the Ascension Island accepted the recommendations to turn 100% of Ascension's EEZ into a marine protected area. So, six projects, just a whistle stop tour of these six amazing projects and real credit to the amazing individuals and institutions that implemented them in the South Atlantic. They would, but none of this would have been possible without the support of the BEST 2.0 program funded by the European Union and um, implemented by IUCN. Hopefully you found these inspiring. Uh, I will, as I said, circulate the videos as well. It's, it gives you a much better flavor when you see visually um, in situ, the project managers talking about their project. But we also, that, that isn't the end. And the next program under BEST, uh, under BEST 2.0, so BEST 2.0 Plus was launched in 2020 um, for small grants up to around 100 thousand euros 
And in the South Atlantic, again, we had a successful, um, some successful applications in the region, and these have included uh, a few projects, uh, two of them I want to mention here. So we now are looking forward to the implementation of the restoration and conservation of Motley Island native peatland habitats in the Falkland Islands, uh, again implemented by the Falklands Conservation, the last best, best 2.0 branch recipients. And then another one in St. Helena, that is a slightly different one. So a move away from the very practical ones last round. And this one is looking at establishing a St. Helena biological record system being led by the newly formed St. Helena Research Institute that is part of the Education and Employment Directorate of the St. Helena government. Next slide. So that's it. I want to give credit to um, Debbie Barlow, who is the best, who was the best 2.0 um, officer and is the best 2.0 plus officer. Uh, who did most of the preparation work of this presentation. Um, also to her predecessors, um, Mike Javois, Julia Zuvik, and um, Danny Biagori, the best 2.0 project officers for the South Atlantic over the years. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's a wonderful program. It's been a pleasure working with IUCN and I know all of our region really values this program of work. When I put out a call to the project managers to say, you know, is there anything that you want us to say in this forum at the World Con Congress? And it was really, um, the feedback was very much about the value of the program, um, just celebrating what has been achieved and passing on gratitude for um, the funding stream that has enabled all of this to happen. So the image that you have here is our website, Sari's website, where we have all of the projects, the video links and everything online. And that's it. It really is um, one of the streams of work that we run at Sari, something that is really enjoyable to be a part of and really a pleasure to see all of the wonderful achievements of all of this exciting work that's happening in our region. So thank you very much. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Sarah, and congrats. And uh, thank you for the feedback. This was actually going to be one of the questions, uh, what, how your experience was with BEST and whether you had any uh, things to point out that maybe should reach the European Commission for the upcoming calls when uh, this will be incorporated into their work. Um, I don't know if that's the case. You can uh, take a few seconds to think about it. And uh, best of luck with uh, the ongoing projects. I hope these turn out to just as uh, just as good. Fingers crossed for that. Indeed, thank you very much. I, as I say, I think everybody has really found the program very very valuable because it does target, you know, the scale at which uh, many of the islands or even some of the smaller entities within the islands work at. So, um, yeah, a a and being able to implement, as I said, you know, a range of projects from things that are very practical, like building a, you know, a, a pathway where it's needed to, to more um, research and evidence, more evidence-based decision-making. So I think that range has been very, very valuable as well. So, yeah. And we are well, looking forward to these new projects too. It's, it's always wonderful to see you know, they, they, it, it always seems when it's an idea and then it's converted into reality and in the end, it all, most of them seem to overachieve, um, which is great. Do you expect any impact from the pandemic or things should continue as planned? Well, I think, um, so the South Atlantic is probably, well, not now, for, for many months into the pandemic, none of the islands of the South Atlantic had any COVID cases. Um, and I think that's still true for uh, St. Helena, Ascension and Tristan. Um, the Falklands has had a few and has managed it as well. So the, it, on islands, there hasn't really been, 
you know, the islands haven't shut down in terms of the ability to move around on island. Obviously, there's been the impact in terms of visitors and access to and from the islands. But in the ability to move around on island, they, they didn't shut down at all for very long. So that means, you know, any in-country work has been able to continue um, in a way that it hasn't done in almost the, all of the rest of the world. So that means that there's quite a lot that is able to still be implemented. Um, it's just if there's any, you know, requirements for imports, exports, and any knock-on effect from what's happening globally, then there might be some delays. But at the moment, it seems like everything's on track. Yeah. That's great to hear. Mm. Let's hope uh, this stays that way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, They're very, they've you. been very lucky. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, and I thank you again for bearing this uh, presentation and uh, for explaining uh, the photos. Not everybody does this, so uh, this was a very nice touch. <laughs> okay, thank you. No, thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, I'm really great to work with IUCN um, as well. You know, there's so many interconnected elements of this KBAs, you know, endangered species red list, as well as the Best Human Zero Plus programs. So it's nice to see all of it coming together under this scheme. Yes. Indeed, and we look forward to the end of uh, this first call for Best Human Zero Plus and second call for Life for Best to aggregate all the results. We're working on a platform that will be able to process uh, the indicators. So we'll get some uh, concrete data on the effects of the whole initiative. So okay, we look promise. forward to that. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be posting this uh, our video soon on the website and we'll circulate it uh, widely. So thank you again for uh, your effort and we look forward to uh, seeing you again. Excellent. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care. All the best. All the best. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.